So <clears throat> today we're going to see a little bit of, of the use in doing all this modularization work uh, by looking at testing and debugging. Uh, two techniques that will really be helpful if you're uh, developing software and want to have that software be maintainable. In other words, you, you're going to have continuous changes and, and you want to make sure that those happen uh, well. Um, and they really come from a couple of uh, realities that you might not realize when you're just writing a little program to get something done. Um, the first thing is scientific software is almost always large, complex, and, and subtle. Not the first time you write something to compute something, but it will become that. <clears throat> it's all, uh, also always uh, evolving. Like it's, there are research codes, right? So even if your code solved something very well, now the next months you might want to consider a different case, and your code might have to be adapted. So the nature of scientific software is that it always is changing. <clears throat> And um, another thing that happens more often than you, than you would hope is that that little piece of code that you wrote to get something done quickly that you hope will never be seen uh, will be used by the next graduate student, or maybe you are the next graduate student and you got that piece of code. And so if it's set up properly, you can just keep on working on it rather than spending uh, half a year trying to understand what it does and throwing it away and just starting from scratch. So uh, code. So this is the nature of scientific code, and it's, it has a lot of that in common with other scientific, uh, with other software development, but especially in, in, in the sciences, things are constantly changing because you're doing new projects and new research, and it's not just, a, it's not just an application, so the code is a product. Uh, so um, if we look back, to, back at the uh, code that you just looked at um, to modularize the, the damped wave equation, you saw there were sets. There were there are parts that had to read parameters, set initial conditions, uh, compute the evolution of the wave in time and output result. All of those could be several uh, modules um, because at any time you might want to change some of these, these separately. Uh, you might want to have a different way to read in the parameters. Uh, maybe you get some parameter file, but more likely you'll have maybe different initial conditions. Uh, maybe you want to have a more accurate way to compute the time evolution, which does not change the initial conditions. Um, maybe your output has to be different. Maybe it now has to create a plot. All of these are, are separate things that can change um, uh, with your code as your project evolves. So to manage this complexity, uh, it, it really pays off to use modularity. Um, and what, you're, what you've been doing is, is extracting the different parts that are responsible for something else. Uh, they're, they should be fairly independent, um, and, and they should be so independent that if I change the implementation of one module, it shouldn't affect the other module. Okay? So if I change the way I write my output, I shouldn't have to do anything with the way that I uh, do my time evolutions. Those, those two should be orthogonal, right? Um, and when that is the case, if you set it up that way, this complex piece of code becomes more manageable. In fact, if you have enough grad students in your group or enough postdocs, you could eat, have each part be maintained by a different person. Maybe somebody is really good at writing uh, binary net CDF files. Uh, somebody is really good at algorithms for, for high precision time evolution. Somebody is really good at parsing input files. They can do this separately without having to understand the whole code. Um, another thing that is really nice about this is that if it is modular, once one part is working well, you just use it as an appliance. So this piece of code that wrote out the, the binary file, well, maybe you can use it in the next code because it doesn't really matter what you're, uh, what you're uh, computing as long as it's outputted in the same way. So basically, these, these parts become appliances if they work well. Which brings me to the topics of today. How do you know that they do work well? What, like, you had this, this big code, you, you modularized it, how do you know that the different parts are actually doing things correctly uh, on their own? And so for that, we'll introduce something called unit testing. Um, it's a way to try and make sure that your module works correctly. Um, and then suppose that we've done this unit testing and we find out it works correctly, fine. What if you find out that it does not work correctly? Um, something went wrong, we'll have to do a thing called debugging. So if there's a bug in the code, um, we'll have to, and, we'll, uh, and we'll see that uh, the modularization makes both of these tasks uh, easier. So let's do unit testing first. 
Um, so before we do unit testing, let's imagine what we have to do if we want to test uh, a, a big monolithic code, one big C, C file that, that contains everything. Um, and conceptually, it kind of looks uh, like on the right here. There are some input files. There's a bunch of functions that call each other in, uh, in uh, possibly unknown names. Maybe there are no functions. It's just lines of code, uh, variables used all over the place, and some output. And so if that's what you have, if you have just one big code, um, all you can do to test it is to basically try it. So you're going to run it. Now, suppose you wanted to know the evolution of this damned wave equation, and you run it, and you get an output. You have no way to know that it is correct, because the, your research project was to find out what it is that it does. So to have a proper test case, you'll have to compute something that you already know. So you'd have to give it um, some sort of initial condition of which you know uh, what will happen. And if this is a very expensive computation, you'll also want to make it simpler. You'd want to take a small case. Maybe you don't have a million grid points, maybe you have 10, right? Um, the result isn't going to be very interesting or very useful, but that's not the point. That, that you're going to try and give a simpler use case or a simpler input um, so that you know exactly what should come out. And then you can check. So that's a test. It's a test to see if your code, if your, your application can reproduce something that you already know. Uh, it's going to be smaller, and it's going to be uh, uh, simpler, um, because otherwise you wouldn't know what to, what, what to expect. So this can only prove if something is incorrect. Right? And this is, the, this is the conundrum with testing, but it's the whole conundrum with science. We cannot prove anything in science. We can only prove that something is not right. And yet we seem to be more and more confident in our scientific theories. The same is true for, for software development and testing. Um, you have a test. If it fails, your program was, was wrong. If it passes, you have more confidence that your code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay? So it's a good test, and especially a good test, because suppose it was working, and you change something in the code, it should still be working. So it's a good way to test that something broke along the way as you were editing your file. Some bugs slipped in. Um, so tests are still very useful, even if you're, you're confident in your software. OK? But the trouble with integrated testing is that if this is what you have, you have only one data point. It either worked or it didn't work. It's true you could come up with some other input examples to give you more tests. But um, you don't know if the different parts are, are defective or if they just happen to not be called in a way that, that makes them fail. Now, if you've modularized the code in, say, n parts, you're in a better situation where you can test each of the n parts. So if your code can look like, or is, is nicely modularized, I can make an input for each of my modules and expect some output and create a test for each of them. So each of these modules should now be able to be tested. So you could think of these, these blocks, these colored blocks, as, as maybe functions that you defined, right? Um, rather than having everything in one big function, you have different functions that have has input and output. Um, <coughs> and as long as you steer, stay clear of global variables, these are isolated functions. Nothing like it either goes into the function, out of function, you control that. So you can write a test that gives certain input to the function uh, of which you know what should come out and, and see if it indeed does. Okay, so that's the idea of, of unit testing. Each of these units, each of these parts of your code, each of the modules can be tested separately. Um, <coughs> what is also very nice about that is, is, is not just that it gives you n more points, so more confidence in your code. It also means that if something doesn't work, say, uh, say my yellow square there gives me an error, then, but the other ones all pass their tests, then all I have to look uh, at is the code that, is, uh, uh, that, that produces that yellow square. Right? So there's a lot less lines of code to look at uh, to find the error. So this will, uh, will speed up uh, my, my debugging as well. So none of this could be done if you didn't modularize. All you could do if you don't modularize is integrated testing, which you should still do. Uh, but um, at this point, you can, you can do so much. That's clear. That's the idea of integrated or of unit testing. It makes sense. Um, it makes things move faster. You can, you can spit things out to, to different people or just say, just for your own sanity, if I know that I'm working on, on the triangle, then I don't have to worry about any of the details in the square. And, and that's just, that's just kind of nice.
So I'm putting on the screen here uh, the example of a couple of lectures ago, uh, which I never explained very well, but a code that is pretending to compute the ground state of a hydrogen atom, uh, which it doesn't, but um, let's just pretend. <coughs> and this was the one big unmodular monolithic code um, that I've renamed now from hydrogen.cc to, to hydrogen underscore monolithic.cc because I'm going to make something better out of it. Um, there's a couple of functions that are sort of cryptic. Lots of stuff is going on in int main. And uh, who knows what it is. So, so I've modularized this just to give you the, the idea of how that helps. And once I modularized this, this was what my in main looked like. Um, so you'll notice a, a few extra header files being included. Those are the header files of, of the modules in this case, the outputs, uh, init mods, and eigenvalues. And um, if I name, if I use reasonable names for functions and modules, um, it'll be more evident what the, the code is going to do. So um, my first line in int main sets an n, and then I define a matrix of n by n and a vector of, of length n, and then I initialize a matrix, and, uh, and then I compute the ground state of that matrix, and, uh, and I'm writing out uh, the vector a, both in ASCII and in binary. We saw a bit of this before, too, where we had these these two uh, ASCII and binary write, uh, uh, writing functions. Now, this still misses things like proper comments, um, which I'm not putting on the slide because they, they would get a little bit in the way of the point. But a lot of the functionality has moved into, into the different units and into the different modules. Um, now, to get that all tied together, I need a make file. Just, so just for completion, I show you kind of what the make file would look like. So we have, this is still called hydrogen, and it's going to be made um, uh, from a bunch of object files with a link line, and each of the object files um, is, is, uh, is coming from uh, one of the uh, module source files. Now you'll notice, for instance, here, look at the output array .o, only needs the source for output array and its header file. It doesn't need the other points. And this is this, you'll see this with all of these mod, uh, modules. So this crisscross um, dependencies that we saw in, in, the, in an earlier picture, they're not here. So we really have sort of a straightforward uh, one module only depends on itself. And so let's look at the output array for a second. Here are the header files for, for that. Um, they're pretty much the same as we saw before. We have two functions in the header file, to bin and to ask. Uh, they take a string and an array, and they write uh, that array into the file of that string. Uh, again, there should be common saying that, but I'm just saying it with word string. And then the, imp the, the implementation is right here. So two, two, uh, two of these uh, uh, functions in this module. Yeah? Uh, well, imagine that you have a function inside your module that actually requires another inside the same function. Yeah. No. So, 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 if for some reason uh, to ask would have to call to bin, that that, that would be okay. You can just keep them in that module. No. So, if it's in the same file, the compiler will find all the all the functions in that file. Um, you could even have common functions that are only used by by these guys, but not on the outside. And you could put them in. So, you could have, uh, yeah. So you don't have to separate the different each function in a different file. You put the functions together that sort of work together. I mean, it, you don't have to. You could. You could split it up, but there's no reason. That said, maybe that works for then you other of the Yes, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. So I, I, make, I, I like to do this. It's not strictly necessary for this to compile in this case, uh, just so that uh, the compiler has a second check on whether these functions and those functions are indeed the same. Um, uh, you, sh you should usually compile with a flag called dash w all, and then it will warn you about a lot of the things you might be doing wrong. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yes, so the hydrogen, yes. 
Yes. Um, because if I suppose I changed something in output array and uh, dot h, and in this case it only contains the functions, but suppose it has a definition of a constant. That so maybe there's a flag that rather than have right. If I don't, if I put the header the header file implementations here, when I change that constant, I don't get a re compilation of output array dot o, but it might affect. Right, so so anything that if I recompile, any any change in a file that would cause a change in the object file, should be listed. Yeah. If you if you leave it out, um, you'll miss you'll miss some things in, in compilation. If you start from scratch, it doesn't matter. So if but the, but the nice thing about the module is that of about the make file is that if I just change something in output.h, it would recompile hydrogen o and output array dot o, and nothing else. If I, if I get rid of all of the object files and start a fresh compile, then, then it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. okay. are, there, are there a lot of benefits of separate CC files for all the functions? For all the one CC file? Uh, for each module, you could have all your functions in one CC file. Uh, there's, there's not much benefit to that. In fact, there's, there's sort of a... Uh, and the disadvantage because suppose that your header files tells you these two these two functions exist, and I haven't carefully named the two functions or the, the two files where they're in. Now I have to guess what file are they in, and then it's right. easier just to open the whole source file of the module and say, okay, my function is going to be in here. You have a list of well, the header files should pretty much be there, okay. right? And otherwise, you just search through it. But I don't have to open three, four, five files and find that that one. File. So then why <coughs> so, the, so so it doesn't pay to have different files for each module because I don't want to because each time I change one of these files I have to recompile whatever comes out of it right so I don't want to have to recompile uh, things for the eigenvalues if all I'm doing is changing the output so so you separate the the responsibilities right but if Okay, so suppose we have this set up, um, and we went from a, a monolithic code to, to a modular code. Then uh, one of the first things we should do is not unit testing, because we started with a monolithic test, and we can't, uh, we can't really unit test that. Uh, but we'll do an integrated test. And this is something that is actually very useful, um, either to do by hand or to put in your make file, um, where uh, you take your original code that you're going to be changing, you're going to be what's called refactoring into a modular code, um, and you save its output. So you ha just have it run, so here's just, you know, you, you compiled it. In this case, I could compile it with, with a, a straight single compilation line. Um, and I run it, and I put the output in, uh, in a different file. That's sort of, that its name indicates where it came from. And because this function, or this, this application, saves its, its data, in data.bin and data.txt, which is hard coded and which it shouldn't do and we should fix at some point, but at this stage that's what it does. We'll move these guys over to uh, to have a different name that again reflects that they came from the old code. Then I'm going to make the modular code and I'm going to run it again and and put its output into a file that is just hydrogen.out. So that's that's the new file. Um, it will also have generated a new data.bin and data.txt. This is why I moved them into different files, so I won't overwrite them and I compare them later. So once I've run them in the old way and in the new way, and I have these three files, I can compare the, I can compare the outputs and see if they still give the same stuff. If all I'm doing is rearranging code and modularizing, they should give the same result. Um, this is especially true if you don't uh, compile with, with optimization that might cause the compiler to some funny business. So this should be exactly the same. Uh, there's two commands in, in, in Linux to do this comparison. There's a diff command that does text file comparison, and there's a CMP command that can do binary file uh, comparison. Uh, since uh, out and text are text-based and these are binary, this is how I did it. So it'll tell you whether they're, they're different. In fact, if they're the same, it won't say anything. <laughs> That's very Linux-like. Uh, so I can check whether I still have the same. So as you're doing, uh, a, a refactoring, so a, a change of the code that isn't really changing what it does, but how it is structured. 
um, this is a good thing to have. This is a, a, a very valid integrated test where you say, okay, my old stuff and my new stuff give the same results, so they're fine. Um, and you have to do it when you're, when you're modernizing because you can't do unit tests yet. Okay. So I don't know if you guys tried to do this as you were modernizing. We didn't say you had to, but it would be very useful to know that you're on the right track in order that you made a mistake. Um, one warning, just for comparing output, um, especially in binary uh, output, we are dealing with floating point numbers, and we'll learn a lot more about floating point numbers in the next lecture. Um, this byte for byte comparison, this this is isn't quite doesn't always work. Um, floating point is subject to round off, and round off can mean that one variant of the code and another variant of the code might not be exactly the same, but very close. Maybe they're 10 to the minus 15 close. That might be close enough for you. Uh, but these tools, comp and diff, won't, will, will fail. They'll say, okay, something went wrong. So you'll need to build something more, uh, more sensitive to, to, to allowing some tolerance. Yes, so, so diff will tell you what line it went wrong. So that's nice. Uh, but it won't tell you where in the code it went wrong, because it can't. I'll just tell you where in the output it was, it was wrong. So how to know where in the code it went wrong, that's the part, that's the debugging part, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay, so that's the, that's the integrated testing. Um, again, makes sense. Uh, things before and after should be the same uh, if it's the same code. And, as you're, and you could still do this if you're making changes to the code, um, modular or not. Uh, this is something you can always do, and it's something that you should try and do. Um, but now that we have a modular code, we can also make unit tests. So we can make unit tests for any of the modules. So I picked out the output array, because you don't have to know much about the problem to understand uh, roughly what's going on. And um, while there are very good and decent unit testing frameworks that you can use, uh, in some cases you just write your own test. So here's a test that is supposed to uh, see if our to ask routine is working properly. So it's here in the middle, and this happens with tests. There's a lot of setting up the test and checking it that, that, does, that masks a little bit what we're trying to test. But this is what we're trying to test. We're trying to test whether uh, we can write to a file called testoutputarray.txt, and we'll write some vector. There'll be some setup. We have to create that vector to be written. So um, here, here it gets create, created. This is a vector of three elements. This sets its elements, um, and then this, this writes it out. Now, we've write it, ri written it out, but now we have to test whether it was correct. So how do I do that? Well, I'll just read it in with something else, obviously something, something that, is, that is separate. So in this case, uh, I, I can read it in with an if stream, uh, get uh, three strings. It'll read in the three lines or the three numbers that it would have printed to ASCII, and then it checks. Whether, now, this reads in strings. I haven't converted them to, to integers because I don't want to make too many steps in my testing. If I start converting them to integers, the more lines I put in my text, test, um, the, like, the more likely it becomes that I made an error writing the test. So things might fail not because my unit was wrong, but, but because my test was wrong. So you keep your test as simple as possible. So in this case, I just test if the string 1 uh, gives me a string of 1 because if I write out 1 in ASCII, in a file, and I read it in, I get a string that says 1. And a string 2 should be 2, and string 3 should be 3. If that's not the case, I'll just print that the test has failed. If it is uh, correct, then I say the test has passed. Um, so this is a simple test. Yes, there's, there's a bit of code there, but it's all fairly straightforward, um, at least conceptually. Um, and one of the reasons this is actually more complex than most is that we're reading in a file. If you're just doing some variable uh, uh, manipulation, you just check if that variable is equal to the, the number that you, you expect it to come out. Uh, it's typically a little easier. But. OK, so is, it, so is that clear? This is the unit. But this only, only calls to ask. It only has to include the header file for, uh, for output array. And if I want to build it, I only have to link with the output array.a. So I get, uh, I get output test.cc and, out, and output array.cc. Those two have to be compiled, but the rest doesn't have to. And so I can add this test into my make file. And this is, yeah, sorry. Yes. 
So by convention, uh, Unix applications, when they exit, will give an exit code to the operating system. And if that exit value is zero, that signifies success. Anything non-zero is an error. And so um, if this test would be part of something, uh, something uh, uh, greater, to, right? Um, we have to tell the operating system that something went wrong or did not. So returning one will tell the operating system, hey, this went wrong. Uh, zero will tell the operating system it went right. So that's fine. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Um, so, so added to the make file. Um, and you see when I, so now when I type make test, if we try to run this binary, if the binary doesn't exist, it tries to build it from the rule. If one of the uh, object files doesn't exist, it builds it from the, from the rules. Um, but it will only, only, only um, involve the output arrays. And then this test will actually run and will print either uh, success or not. In this case, there, it passes. Um, and so we've, uh, we've built a unit test for, uh, to ask. You can imagine writing more tests for it. You can imagine writing more complex tests for it. But if this, one if this one doesn't pass, something went wrong. I'm deliberately writing out things that are uh, integers. Um, so I actually don't have this round off issue. Um, but it's, it's uh, so to do this properly, I should have each module have a test suite. Output array should have a test suite. And I say test suite because every function or every class that's in your module should get tested, right? Otherwise, there might be parts of your code that you, ha you cannot have any confidence in. So if you're doing this very, very diligently, and you might not always have time, but ideally, ideally this is what you would do, you would take every function that is in your module, you'd write a little test for it, you put that test into your make file, so that all you have to do is type make test, and it tests all those things for you. Right now, you have built your own framework. Um, so for instance, uh, the two bin, uh, uh, functions should really also have a test. And that's why I'm call the, calling these test suites, uh, because there's a bunch of tests uh, that all belong to the module, not just one test for one module. It can be a bunch of them. I could try printing out um, a, a longer array and see if that still works. Uh, that's a separate test part of the suite. Right. Um, now, I already pointed that out. Uh, and again, so this testing will actually give you confidence in each module separately. And so once I, go, I know that they work well, I could use them somewhere else and, and, and not be worried. And I can use those unit tests in that other project, right? They, they are part of the module, not part of your, your application per se. I mentioned this already, but there are testing frameworks. And that's because there is extra coding to do these tests. And in fact, uh, the part that you're coding that you're testing for is like one line, and the rest is all setting, thing, setting up some variables, passing it to your function and testing those variables, or even worse, in this case, um, testing the, func the, the output files that it created. Um, and these tests, they have to be maintained as well. Every time you add lines of code to your code base, they're, they're, you have created more spots for you to make mistakes in. And so you want to keep that as short as possible. A lot of these things, are repetitive too. The thing that just writes the name of the test or, or checks if it fails or returns one when it's, correct, when it's not correct or zero if it's correct, um, it's easy to make a typo and just reverse those, have the if and else wrong. So that's why you have frameworks. If you're doing a lot of testing, it helps to have a lot of this overhead taken care of and, 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 and um, be tested itself. Uh, a few ones kind of stand out. Uh, as being fairly well developed. Uh, boost.test, which is part of the Boost library suite, which is a whole bunch of libraries um, uh, for C++ that are uh, sort of peer reviewed in a sense. So they, they, they don't get into the library suite until they are approved. So boost.test is one of them. And, and um, another one that is fairly popular is the Google C++ testing framework. It's also known as Google Test. So if you're Googling it, Google, Google Test. Um, uh, but there's, there's a bunch of them. And uh, if you're going to use any of them for your homework, then uh, please use boost test. It would take us too long 
for ourselves to learn all different frameworks you might find out there. So just, just even if you already like the Google C++ testing framework, please just either write your own tests and not use a framework, which is fine, or use Boost Test. Um, and so if you're going to use this Boost Test, um, this is kind of what it would look like. So this is the uh, sort of the equivalent case for, uh, uh, for testing to ask. And it has a couple of funny little parts. Um, you have to define a module name. You have to define this variable boost test dynamic link. Don't ask me exactly why. You can imagine it has to do with dynamic linking, but um, if you don't, things fail. Uh, but then once you've done that and you've included the boost test unit test header, um, you can create test cases just like that. So you just say, I'm going to have a test case. It's called to ask underscore test. Um, and you can create your file. This is where it, where it does that. You can read it back and you can check. So I didn't have to do much in terms of returning one, returning zero. Um, I have to, uh, right, my if statements can suddenly be wrong because I just say, this is what you should check for. Um, I could have several checks in there. I could have um, fatal checks or checks that will fail, but it will still go on. You have a lot of different possibilities in here. And then you can compile it simply by compiling as usual with the output. So output BT is the, is the boost test in this case. Uh, you'd have to still link with output array.o. And then you have to link with this library. We'll talk about libraries a lot later. A dash small l, and it's hard to see, but that's what this means, small l, boost unit test framework will link in all of the machinery that makes these things work. And then if you run it with uh, log level all, so you see everything, um, then it'll say I'm running one test case, or you have one, entering the test suite's output BT. So you can have several tests in there, but we have only one here, entering this test. And then it'll do, just go, OK, info, I've checked this, and no errors were detected. If you have more tests, it'll do all of them. There's ways to select which tests you want. That's kind of nice. Suppose you only, uh, you only want to know if the, you only work for, at the to ask. You only want to do the test that's for to ask. Uh, so you get a lot by using them, but, uh, but, if it, but you know, you'll have to use them per se. Yes? So, so this is where you kind of have to trust the framework. <laughs> to do what, it, what it's supposed to do. It, it essentially makes this into a function. But, um, so it makes this into a function. We had a function already that, that was more or less, in, in our old case, it was called main. In this case, it's to ask test. And you could have a whole bunch of these functions. But in addition, uh, if, you're, if you should be able to pick which function you want to run after you've compiled it, so by doing some command line arguments, um, somehow, there has to be a list of all possible functions to call. And there has to be something that parses the arguments and says, OK, you meant this function, so I'm going to call this function and not the other. So not only does this create a function, it also puts this in some sort of a list or a registry. Uh, that's actually what the auto does. It automatically registers this as a valid test that you can select from the command line. And then somewhere else, there's an int main that actually is there to parse your arguments. All of that is part of the framework. So all you have to worry about at this point is to write a function that would test something and then to wrap that function into boost auto test case. And then all of that other stuff is automatic. Okay. Okay, so that's that's a bit of, of uh, RRA. Um, where's RRA? Oh, it's in the output. Um, syntax. So that actually assigns the values 1, 2, 3 into this vector that has three elements. I could have written a what? A, yeah. No it's, no, it's just a test case. I could do something else as long as what I put in and what I check for are the same. I just choose something that, okay, let's, let's write out 1, 2, 3. I don't want to do 1, 1, 1 because then. Uh, suppose it writes out in the opposite order for some weird reason. I wouldn't detect that if these aren't unique. So I just pick something that is simple, uh, doesn't require a lot of checking, um, but could fail. So if this is, for instance, your disk is full and this writing uh, out fails, then this will fail because it will not read in one, two, three. I just chose something very, very arbitrary, but, but unique and identifiable.
So that's, that's in a nutshell, unit testing. That makes sense? So it's, it's really about getting confidence in your code, making sure the different modules work as they are. Um, and, and as your project is evolving, uh, bugs will slip in. You might have made a, a, a change in the to ask function, and now you forgot to write the last element or something like that. You would pick it up right away as soon as you make that mistake. So each time you, you change the module, you should run your tests and see if, if everything still works. So that's sort of a preventative way to make sure that things aren't, uh, aren't going wrong too bad. But what if they do, right? What if your code is not running correctly? Now, who here has ever had a code that doesn't run correctly? Nonsense. All programs execute correctly. You just told it to do the wrong thing. And that's the real kicker with debugging. It, there's no bugs. They don't exist. The program does exactly what you told it to do. The trouble is, what we think we told it isn't what we told it. So our mental model of what we think the program is doing and what we're actually telling it to do is wrong. This is why debugging is hard. I have this little cartoon. I don't uh, understand how my brain works. My, but my brain is what I rely on to understand things. So is that a problem? I'm not sure. The mental model is in your brain, and your brain is trying to figure out what's wrong with the mental model. This is why you need help. So this is where the buggers come in. So you could, be, you could think very hard about your problem, and maybe you will be able to change your mental model into, into being correct and saying, oh, I did this, whereas I meant that. And eventually you will get there, right? But you need a little help. And so figuring out what your program is actually doing um, is, is going to be useful to know where, where things start to deviate from what you think it's going to do and what it is really doing. Um, now, you can avoid debugging a little bit by writing better code. We've tried to do that with the modularization and, and doing, uh, doing tests. Uh, avoid queue tricks. Don't write up, uh, obfuscated C code. Um, it, it, you might think it's clever to be able to solve your problem in a one-liner rather than a 10-line function, but will you still understand that code in a month? And what if there is a mistake? Will you ever find it? So um, you, could you could avoid getting bugs in your code by not writing code. It sounds silly, but it's true. So if you use existing libraries that already have the functionality you're after and they are tested, then you don't produce any new bugs. At testing, we talked about that. Switch on the w all flag. So whenever you compile, you can do dash w all and, uh, and, and inspect the warnings. This will give you all kinds of warnings. Make sure you understand them. Make sure why uh, things aren't the way uh, the compiler would um, want them to see done and, um, and fix them if, if, because they, they are typically potential bugs. There's something that you might not mean to do it this way. Um, and, and the compiler will give you those hints. And you can check for arguments. You can use a cert. Um, here's a little example of how you would use a cert. Um, there's a little header called C assert. If you're computing a square root, you could check if the argument is bigger or, zero, bigger or equal to zero before you return anything. Um, this might be a little bit um, fine-grained, but doing some of these asserts at a higher level could catch things. Your, your program will crash if it, if it doesn't match the assertion, and it'll tell you where. So um, that's sort of defensive programming. But suppose this really, really didn't work, OK? Um, you know, suppose there is a real bug. And suppose you've already eliminated a whole bunch of possibilities. You, the bug is in a specific module. The module has a test. The test has a very small case to look at. So all of these things you've already done. But now you need, need to know, OK, where does it go wrong? I know it goes wrong. I can reproduce it. That's important. It's a scientific method. Um, how do I get there? Um, which of these things, for instance, is going wrong? Do I have a corner case? Am I taking the square root of minus 0 or infinities? Um, is my index out of range? Am I trying to access an element of an array that doesn't exist? Um, am I putting wrong input in there? Is my syntax wrong? The compiler will tell you that. But if the syntax is wrong but still valid, it will just do the wrong thing. Um, do I have a memory leak? So I run out of memory, and that's why I crash. Um, there's uh, a couple of 
specific bugs related to parallel programming that we'll see towards the end of the course, uh, race conditions, deadlock, which of these is, is the case? So to figure out what they are, um, there's two general strategies. There's the, I'm going to put print statements everywhere and see what's going on and whether my, 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 my variables have the value that they should have, or use a debugger. Um, the debugger can do point one as well, so it's sort of a, a superset of this. Um, but you know, it's hard to find any programmer that hasn't done one. Like I, I still do this every now and then. Going, I don't, I'm not gonna, just going to print out what happens. Um, so what's wrong with that is that you're in this constant cycle of trying to add print statements where you think something could be going wrong to compile it and run it, and then analyze the output too, only to find that, well, everything seems honky-dory uh, uh, as, as far as these print statements are concerned. So let's add some more st statements and compile again and run again and analyze the output. So you're just constantly adding these things. And, and this is kind of related to this idea that your mental picture will tell you where to put print statements, but your mental picture was wrong, right? So, and then after the fact, you have to remove all these print statements. And so you could even make errors removing a print statement and, and remove more, more than you wanted, uh, creating more bugs. And then for every bug, you basically do this. So it's a bit time-consuming, error-prone, and it also changes things. All these print st statements, especially if you have memory, memory issues, um, change the exact layout in memory. So it could affect things. So the better way is to use a debugger. Um, it can do a bunch of things. Um, it can do very useful things like, OK, your program crashed. Where did it crash? Just give that. If a, if a program in Linux crashes, it will produce what's called a core file. You give that core file to the debugger, and it'll tell you that's where it crashed. It might not be the source of the error, but at least it will tell you where it stopped, uh, which otherwise you have no idea of. Um, you can see what functions were called. So from that point of the crash, you can see, OK, what function was I in? Uh, who called that function? What other function called that function? So the whole stack up from int main down to, to your lowest level. Um, that's if it things are already crashed. Suppose you, you it, it, does, it doesn't crash, it hangs for a long time. You could go into your code and, do, and step through it line by line and see where, where it goes. Um, almost all codes have some branch points where there's an if statement that says, if this, then do this, else do something else. Which, which path is it taking? And stepping through, through, through the code will tell you that. Um, you can even have your code run until a certain point. So say you know that the error is in the toAsk function. You put what's called a breakpoint in the toAsk function, and you run the whole thing until it hits there, and then you can go line by line. Um, and then you can play with variables. You can see what the variable values are. You can change them, which is something with print statements you can't do. So with, with five, sort of, sort of, you don't need to print statements anymore. Um, there's different debuggers. Um, if you're working on your own desktop, um, something graphical is convenient. And graphical, I just mean okay, just, there's a GUI. The, you have one part of, of the GUI is your code. Another part, you can type the commands to, to, to the debugger. Um, you might have your variables hanging around somewhere else. Um, when you're doing that remotely, like if you're, if you're running on Synet, uh, that kind of graphical stuff can be kind of slow. So typically, you want to then stick to the lowest common denominator, which is a text-based debugger. So we're going to quickly look at some, some of that just to give you an idea of how it works. And there's one thing that's very important. And, and if you've looked at the slides, I, I tend to do this already. You have to prepare your executable to be understandable uh, for, for these debugger programs. And basically, you just add dash g to the compilation and to the link line. Now, because there are differences in versions of the compiler, and the, uh, the, the, the debugger, and they don't always talk the same language. You can be sometimes more specific. This is just an example of what language or flavor of the debugger they're speaking. So here, in this case, I chose gstabs. Uh, so stabs is a particular kind. So if you run into trouble, you can play with this. But dash g usually is enough. Um, you might want to switch off optimization as well, just because that if you optimize your code or you let a compiler optimize the code, it will shuffle around the order of execution, which is very confusing if you're trying to do step by step. And step by step starts to mean this. Okay, how do you know where you are? Okay. So, so you have to pass that wow. Yes, that. that's right. And like you pass it later on, you 
Well, the minus G actually doesn't hurt much. It just makes your executable a little bit larger. Oh. But you do want to switch back on the optimizations because that can make things quite a bit slower if you don't have optimization. So, so there are so most in most cases you might like if you get a little bit more leverage, you might have two ways of two make files: one for the debug and one for another debug, or or two targets within the make file: one that builds your debug version and one that's the release version. Um, that's usually I just put my CXX flags at the top of the make file and I just edit my CXX flags. I do a make clean and make and I have my debug version and then I go in again and change just the top line. So that's it's not much more work than, than, than maintaining a separate make file. Um, so th this common, uh, this lowest common denominator in debuggers is, is GTB which is the free new license symbolic debugger. Symbolic just means that it knows the name of your variables and functions. So it really should be named to debugger, but they like to call it symbolic debugger. It doesn't mean much. Um, and the reason that it's great and common is that it's everywhere. It's, it's available in many systems. It's old, but still developed. It can do some, some parts of parallel programming. Um, and although it doesn't have a graphical interface, it has what's called a, a text user interface. Uh, which really just means you see your, your code and your commands. If you don't, if you just have, say, your application that we just compiled here, and you say GDB app, you'll get some text saying, hey, I'm GDB, hello, uh, and then you'll get a prompt. You won't get anything else. Um, and so from that prompt, you have to type in commands. So it's command line driven. There's a bunch of commands to start running this program, to set these breakpoints, so you stop whenever you enter a certain function, to step through line by line to see your variables. All of these you type at the prompt. If you add dash 2e here, as you're doing that, it'll show you the code uh, of where, where the, the current execution is. So it's kind of useful, but because it's text-based, it sometimes gets a little bit mangled. Because if your program also pr produces output to the screen, it, it can be messy. Um, let's go on. So, I made a list of some of the uh, some of the things. I was I was planning to do a little uh, demonstration, but we're running out of time. I try this out though. Um, it the list is fairly complete, but what you really need to know to get started is to run. But run will just run your program until the end. So if there was no error, you won't see anything. Uh, you want to break it somewhere. You want to stop the execution. So you set a breakpoint. Uh, typically, I do break main, which will mean it stops as soon as it hits main, which is pretty much right away. Um, uh, you can do, but if you're interested in another function, you could do break and then another function name, and it'll stop at that function. So it knows your function names. That's great. You don't have to say this line number or this file, although you can. Like if you want to stop at a line number, that's also fine. Um, once you're at that breakpoint, you're probably going to step through line by line. So step will create, will we'll execute the line you're at, so wherever you just break, uh, I guess that is it. Um, it will do that line and go to the next line, and you can do step by step. Um, next does the same thing, also line by line, and the difference between step and next is that if that line has any function calls, step will go into the function and start executing line by line that function. Next will execute the function and go to the next line of where you are. So if one function, if function A calls function B, then a next in function A will go to the next line of A. A step will go to the first line of function. So, uh, you can print variables, which is going to be your alternative to print statements. Um, but you'd have to say that at a prompt every time. So you, you're running a little bit. You want to print what is x, print x. Um, and I'll print x. And then you run a little bit more. Uh, so you step a few more times, you print x again. If you want to constantly see what happens to x as you're going on, you can do a display. So you say display x, and then every time you enter a command, once it's done, you'll print what x is now. Um, the, re the rest is fairly specific, and quit to stop. So just knowing print, step, next, and break, and run is sort of enough to get started. Um, I didn't give you anything that broke, so that, that doesn't really help, but um, try running your programs through the file. I'll tell you that I. Uh, this might be good for debugging, but uh, grading your first assignment and running them through a debugger 
well, it's very helpful to know what your code is doing because everybody does it a little bit different. And so if, if, or, uh, if you ever have to grade code, this can be a useful tool as well. <laughs> um, so we'll, if you are going to go graphical, and, and I, there's nothing bad about this, um, I want to point out two ones that I like. One that is free, it's called DDD. Um, it's terribly old, but that doesn't really matter because under the hood it just calls GDB. And if GDB is up to date, DDD can do everything you might want it to do, but it looks a little bit dated. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. I kind of like it. It's nothing fancy. Um, everything is there. Here's your code. Here are your commands. There's, uh, there's some menu. There's run step test. If you have a threaded uh, uh, um, application, they can keep track of that too. So that's, that's nice. It'll show your breakpoints. It's OK. It's just a little bit old in terms of the interface. Um, but it's, and it's free, and it, it hooks into GDB. So everything you can do with GDB, you can still do in the bottom here. That's why I said GDB is sort of the common lowest, lowest common denominator. If you know GDB a little bit, you know almost all of them. Um, another one that's really nice, but you would have to pay for it, is called DDT. It's commercial. It, it looks better, although the, the screenshot isn't great. Um, and it's very good at doing parallel debugging. So if you are going to run on uh, multiple nodes and, and you know, dozens of, of cores at the same time, uh, these free tools aren't really cutting it. And that's why we got a commercial debugger for Synet. Using it at Synet is free. Um, so when you're running on Synet, you have the advantage of using it. It is graphical, so it could be slow. If you're on campus, probably not so bad to connect to the standard computers. If you're doing it from home over your wireless, I would not recommend it. It just it gets too slow. I'm going to stop here. Um, but I, I would really urge you to just try it out. Just, just compile your code with dash g, start the debugger with, with the name of your application. <laughs> Break at main and run and, and see what happens. Okay. They'll step through your, your code. Very, very nice. Questions? Um, about the, uh, the homework, um, we haven't formulated it completely yet, but we'll, we'll post it later today. I'll send around an email saying, hey, it's ready for you to start. And it'll just be due in, in one week, just as it's normal. It'll be three, yes. Thank you.